So I want to continue the uh, series of videos on SN1 versus SN2 and today I want to talk about some inorganic reactions and basically the difference between looking at SN1 and SN2 mechanisms from an organic and inorganic perspective is that for organic we are looking at carbon as a central atom and for inorganic we're just looking at any metal and there's going to be ligands around it. So. Um, when you're talking about um, inorganic reactions, SN1 is often referred to as disassociation. Because what's happening is, let's say you have an octahedral complex, and this is a pretty crowded complex. And indeed, a lot of metal complexes are octahedral because it is the most stable over the largest amount of electron configurations. So what's going to happen is the ligand's just going to pop off and the most likely the most likely transition state here is a square pyramidal So here you get a square pyramidal transition state. Now the other thing that could happen is you could get maybe one of these popping off. And you could end up with something that is trigonal by pyramidal. But overall the most likely is this one. Now there are a couple different things that affect reaction rates. First one is the oxidation state of the center atom. And the higher the oxidation state, the slower the ligand exchange rate will be. Okay. And uh, sort of similar to that, the total charge that you have on the atom, on the central atom, will slow down the reaction. So if you have a decreasing negative charge or an increasing positive charge, so if it's getting more negative or if it's getting more positive, that will slow the reaction. And it does this because there are electrostatic attractions between the ligands and the metal, and just the power of those is going to slow it down. Because remember, we're, we want it to disassociate. That's what starts this whole thing. You've got a five member transition state of all the ligands before you had six coordination number. Next on our list is um, the rate, the uh, type of incoming ligand. And this has no effect. Actually, it has a very small effect, but really it doesn't. It's probably, and that's probably just because of the reaction conditions. And that would make sense because what's starting this is a disassociation process. So the rate of the new incoming ligand that you're going to get on there, that's not going to affect anything. And ionic radius is important.
Smaller ions have slower exchange rates in general. Smaller metal ions. Slower exchange rates. Okay. And finally, steric crowding actually increases the disassociation rate. And that makes sense because if it's not very stable maybe those ligands are going to be more apt to just start popping off so in turn that's really the uh, primary factor that's influencing rate is the rate of dissociation so if you've got steric crowding it's really going to increase the rate and you're going to get a faster reaction So it would also make sense that the rate of reaction will correlate pretty well the metal ligand bond strength of the ligand that is dissociating. So depending on how well these are attached right here, of your original complex, that's going to determine exactly how fast this dissociation occurs. But that makes sense, because really we're only worried about those bonds. And finally, there's another interesting thing in this. The volume of these reactions will increase. And if you think about it, it's because before you started that reaction you only had one species in solution and then you have two well you probably had more than that but just from what we drew first you had this and then you had this plus this so each has their own solvation sphere that's going to increase volume and you have to be careful with this this is good to put on a test maybe but maybe in reality it will not increase the volume of the reaction because each ion has their own solvation effects so you never can tell exactly what it's going to do so that's it for SN1 let's start talking about SN2 and SN2 is pretty short and sweet um, you just have some kind of a uh, let's just do a square planar right here some kind of ligand X will pop on And this is also called association. So then you just end up with um, that. And then maybe you have the X on there somewhere. And to get back to the stability. you're gonna lose one of those ligands so a lot of times square planers are 16 electron complexes and maybe it jumped up to 18 electrons right here and originally it was 16 so you can see it'll just cycle back and forth between those maybe that'll keep happening it'll just keep losing everything In the next step, maybe you'll have another X that comes and attaches. And then one of these will pop off, but you're at 18 right here again. That's kind of how those association reactions go, or SN2. What we call them. And so the differences are, they're pretty much just the opposite of SN1. Um, 
the incoming ligands greatly affect reaction rate. That makes sense because it's just association and all you're really doing is looking to see how this is going to pop onto here to begin with. Okay. And there's usually a negative volume change because you lost a number of species. Usually a negative delta V. And again, same caution as before. but that's generally the correct answer on the test. And it's not as likely with OH but it can happen because remember you're, you're ML6 right there with an OH group octahedral and that's got a lot of crowding to begin with so if you can get anything else on there that's a pretty amazing feat but for the most part that's not going to happen with association, it's going to be dissociation mechanism, although it can happen. And that is about it. So next time I'll go over a little bit more about these reactions, but that is the basics of the difference between association and dissociation from an inorganic perspective.